Asia Daily. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hey, good morning. This is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, you are listening to us in a very beautiful Thursday morning at our ASEAN Daily where we bring you news from Southeast Asia. Yes, and also uh, don't forget this is Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you can always listen to us at www.durianasean.com every morning from Monday to Friday. Yes. <laughs> so, Gauri, there's an update about Lee Kuan Yew's critical condition. Not a very reliable update though. <laughs> yeah, it's not. In fact, uh, it has caused for uh, the Prime Minister office in Singapore to lodge a police report over a fake news on Lee Kuan Yew's death. It's interesting because even on Facebook, I saw a lot of my friends posting saying, oh, rest in peace, Lee Kuan Yew. And I was really? like, wait, what? <laughs> you have so many Singaporean friends? Uh, no, Malaysians. Malaysian who friends. Who actually ah. uh, posted that. Uh, and, and then turns out that it was actually fake. It really shocked me for a bit. Like, wait, what? We just reported yesterday that, yeah, he's in a critical condition. But uh, he's 91. Anything 91. can happen when you're 91. That, that is true. But uh, the fact is, uh, his condition has deteriorated a lot. But he's still hanging on in there. And, uh, well, it's, so the news about whatever news about his death out there just to clarify, it's not real and he's still very much alive. But I don't understand about the police reporting. To me, anyone can make any fake news. Just let it be. Um, the official news, of course, should come from the government or the family of Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, just a bit of a background about Lee Kuan Yew. He was critical critically ill since February the 5th uh, and he has been hospita hospitalized since for pneumonia. And despite being in a very critical condition and uh, his health, of course, it's uh, worsened actually since last week or even since yesterday that we uh, talked about it. But uh, he's uh, still alive. And uh, the reason that they launched a police report was actually because this fake website, uh, despite reporting a fake news, they also used the Prime Minister's office logo to make it seem like it was an official news. Oh, I think that's the reason why the Prime Minister office mm -hmm. is uh, had lodged that police report. You know, the discussion about Lee Kuan Yew is not so much whether he's 91, whether he's mm -hmm. critically ill or not. It's actually the discourse about Lee Kuan Yew should be can Singaporean or even Malaysian imagine a life without Lee Kuan Yew? Hmm, it's uh, a very tricky situation. Uh, we have to ask our Singaporean about. friends mm -hmm. on this because it's like imagining life without Mahathir. Exactly. I, I still remember back uh, in 2004 when Mahathir decided to step down mm -hmm. as uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia. I actually questioned myself, can I actually imagine mm -hmm. a life without Mahathir throughout my teenage years, my childhood? I grew up with Mahathir <laughs> uh, every day on the screen. <laughs> exactly, and even for me, I pretty much don't remember any other Prime Minister because since uh, I was born, it was already Mahathir all the way up to my teenage remember years. Remember the school days when, exactly. when when teacher asked what is your, um, the people you look up to? Mm -hmm. Instantly, everyone would think it about Mahathir. It has to be him. <laughs> it has he to was be the him. most prominent leader in the country at that time. And uh, I think it's a parallel situation here with Lee Kuan Yew as well. Uh, some people may like him, some may hate him to the core, but uh, the fact is it's hard to imagine uh, the country, how it would have turned out without uh, a figure like him. Yeah, and, and I think when it comes to uh, Lee Kuan Yew, similar to when it comes to Mahathir, uh, their uh, premier, sh uh, I mean, their... Um, uh, the the way they led Malaysia and Singapore respectively has been quite similar in a way. It's a bit authoritarian, very visionary people, mm -hmm. and somehow has led Malaysia and Singapore within the Southeast Asia region to be one of the two of the most successful nations. And uh, bringing in mod modernization as well, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, back uh, when Mahathir took over, Atul Mahathir took over. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of respect there. Uh, of course, we know that he's contributed a lot uh, to Malaysia uh, as well. Uh, and a lot of things that we have today... Uh, 
the proton car, the twin towers, a lot of things would not be possible if we didn't actually have uh, Tun Mahathir in charge at that time. The same with Lee Kuan Yew. You wouldn't see the Singapore you see now, you know, the skyscrapers, the modernization, even the MRT. <laughs> These are all things that people will associate with Lee Kuan Yew uh, years from now even. But at the same time, they will also associate, you know, dictatorial regime. Of course. Um, Operasi Lalang for Mahathir mm-hmm. and Call Star for <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew. So many good things and bad things happening at the same time. It's hard to judge this personality except to admire them from afar and mm-hmm. also to feel... I don't know. I don't know what's the word to call it. I guess it. just can't go way too deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever they did, they did for a reason. But uh, It's like having your parents. Sometimes they do certain things that you don't like. You're not happy. But as... Uh, being the people in charge, they just had to do it at the time yeah. because they know that in the long run, it will turn out well for you, or in this case, for the country itself. That's so ASEAN we. <laughs> 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 anyway, on another news is about the update on the A-Asia crash. As we all know, Indonesia has ended its search for 56 bodies. We, um, and uh, these bodies are still missing, actually. So... so uh, of course, this uh, we're talking about the Air Asia flight that crashed in the Java Sea last December, and uh, it was a multinational effort. Actually, a lot of countries came in to help uh, to help with the rescue efforts of all uh, the the victims, the crash victims, and they had a lot of. Uh, obstacles as well along the way. Uh, there were heavy storms during the monsoon season. They had bad weather. But uh, even then, they uh, went ahead and recovered as much as 106 bodies, but there's still uh, 56 left. Uh, but they feel like it's about time that they stopped the whole operation. I think most probably the bodies have been disintegrated into the sea. I still remember watching this one documentary. They put, uh, they put a that peak mm-hmm. in the sea and it's remarkable how within just a couple of weeks not even a month the body just disintegrate and in it's hard to tell what it is even anymore yeah so. it becomes just dust in mm-hmm. the sea um, so regarding on the A Asia crash um, I think the way Tony Fernandez handled it has been quite well similarly to the Indonesian government um, th- unlike the Mass Airlines, I think A Asia flight crash has been handled in a way that people uh, feel more at peace, especially the victims, uh, the fam- victim's family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, they managed to recover the black box uh, within a short period of time as well. And the contents were also released to the public, so everyone uh, knew what happened. And uh, they also went all out for the search and rescue efforts. But uh, like you mentioned, it comes to a point where there's just no reason to do it anymore. Because mm-hmm. even if they do recover the bodies, they probably cannot tell who who is that person mm. or what is it even just to throw back mm. to the days when uh, the f- the flight just crashed, I still remember vividly the strongest image coming up from the A Asia crash uh, stories was the transport minister in Indonesia mm-hmm. sleeping on probably a bench mm-hmm. just to make sure that he's constantly being updated and he's on the site all the time. And I think a lot of people, both Malaysians and Indonesians, were impressed by the way Indonesian authority handled the situation. So anyway, (laughs) Gauri, the next news is about Michelle Obama. She's going to visit Japan and Cambodia. I think we reported earlier about Mm -hmm. this, just a bit of an update about it as well. So she has actually arrived in Japan for her uh, three-day visit meant to highlight her Global Women's Education Initiative, which uh, I think is called uh, Let Girls Learn, that she was going to implement in a few countries all over Southeast Asia. And so she has kicked off her tour. Mm-hmm. to uh, empower uh, women and also to uh, provide the education uh, sorry provide the opportunity for uh, students uh, to uh, education and also to address other uh, social problems that they might be facing as well I think 
when it comes to Cambodia, they definitely need those kind of support, especially by uh, such a strong figure like Michelle Obama. But I'm not sure why Japan. So I think mm-hmm. if you look at the background of the story, there's some form of dem- diplomatic relationship that uh, the U.S. want to strengthen in those in those two countries. And uh, also when we talk about uh, Japan, of course, uh, they are well off if compared to uh, Cambodia, uh, like you were saying. Uh, but uh, they, they were also saying that because she did not uh, accomp- accompany Barack Obama on most of his uh, tour to uh, Southeast Asia, which is why this is also seen as a move where she's making up for that absence that she was not uh, seen in public. So right now she's making that solo tour to actually uh, go and uh, visit these countries and foster relationships with them. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, she said, actually. It is a serious public health challenge, a drag on national economies and global prosperity, and a threat to the security of countries around the world, including our own. And she's saying this not... It's not related to any wars between countries, but actually the fact that if women are not being seen as Mm -hmm. uh, equal, uh, are not being given equal opportunity with men, and this accounted to 62 million girls not being in school, which represents a tragic waste of human potential. And I think that's probably where uh, Japan comes in as well, because if we were to look at Asia or Southeast Asia, we are still quite uh, shaky, I think, when it comes to gender equality or even when it comes to just talking about women's rights itself when when, uh, most of the cultures here, of course, we practice a patriarchal system where men still have a higher place in terms of uh, salary or uh, employment opportunities in a company and uh, that is something that we're still even a a country as advanced as Japan is still kind of lagging behind. I don't completely agree with you (laughs) (laughs) but for now we are going to take a short break Gauri. When we return we will talk more about other countries and what kind of issues they are having. ASEAN Daily First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. And of course, you are with us again on our ASEAN Daily. So Gauri, when it comes to solar, solar impulse or solar powered plane, this is not something that usually we will hear in Malaysia or in any other Southeast Asian country, right? Yes, and it's also the very first time that they uh, they actually came up with a solar power plane. They just uh, flew nonstop uh, from uh, Ahmedabad to Varanasi in India, and it's quite uh, a great feat in the uh, aviation industry. So apparently, it's just a short pit stop in India's northeast before the vehicle pushes on over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, the lake to Mandalay in Myanmar will be flown to Bentran Picard. So it seems like um, it, it is something that uh, we seldom really hear, but I, I think it's kind of cute. It's, <laughs> it's cute. It's also very useful as well because, of course, in this case, they uh, have eliminated the use of fuel, which uh, is a good thing because we have been uh, trying to save up and, uh, of course, the government as well has been trying to uh, get people to uh, be more uh, thoughtful, if I may, when it comes to uh, the using of fuel because uh, it's uh, it's some, not something that you can renew and it can be depleted uh, soon enough. So it's uh, definitely a very encouraging thing that we now have solar-powered planes because planes probably take up uh, the most fuel with the uh, the sizes of the planes themselves. That is definitely uh, true. In fact, I think this will be one of the breaking point, sorry, one of the breakthrough in terms of uh, aviation industry. Uh, the, avi- the aviation industry rely heavily on petroleum. So if solar uh, power plane can somehow replace all the petrol uh, gushing <laughs> planes, that means that in the future, we can travel more often without costing anything to climate change. 
That's right. And of course, like you mentioned, this was just a short distance, but uh, it's the first try and they are, they call it the solar impulse, of course, because uh, it's uh, fully powered by the solar energy. And uh, they are going to test it out for uh, another five months and, and then head back to the United Arab of Emirates. And it seems before this, uh, the first time they had a non-stop plane without refueling was actually back in 1986 with the uh, Voyager aircraft that flew around the world. And after that, this is the uh, another great thing that happened in the aviation industry with this solar-powered plane, which is called the Solar Impulse 2. But why only now? If it's in the <laughs> 80s. <laughs> I mean, if the technology is there since the 80s, why only now people are starting to think about using solar-powered planes? Uh, I think back then it wasn't uh, solar powered. It was just uh, because it went uh, around the world without stopping or refueling. And that is something that uh, doesn't happen all that much. Of course, the plane always needs to uh, have layovers and they need to refuel and, and sort of let the plane uh, rest as well. Uh, and uh, this is the second time that it happened. probably took them that long to uh, figure out how to go about flying a plane without stopping and without refueling. I'm looking forward to <laughs> board an, one of these solar-powered planes. So another news is about ISIS. As we have been discussing since a uh, couple of months ago, especially yesterday when we see videos of IC, uh, ISIS recruitments of children, and most of them are Malay-speaking and Indonesian-speaking children. But today we see that the government is trying to somehow absorb back uh, people who have been through ISIS and apparently Indonesian families lured by ISIS by promise of home, jobs and money. And this is actually a very scary thing because all this while uh, it has always been about how ISIS was trying to lure people in by using a religion as an excuse by uh, going back to the whole fundamentalism that they have been trying to advocate. But it seems that they are pretty smart and they went beyond the whole religion thing and they are giving people jobs and financial stability. But isn't that what a state ought to be? So I, I think they, are, they, I mean, not that I'm saying they are right, but they are definitely preaching what they have always been preaching, which is we are going to create an, a state, a state that is based on Islamic law that we interpret it. We meaning the people in ISIS. So apparently families are promised a house, a job, a 20 million rupiah um, salary or more each if they join the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Who wouldn't want that, isn't it? Exactly. I, I totally agree with you there. And the thing about this is it doesn't just appeal to just Muslims anymore. It pretty much appeals to anybody. You know, when you get a house, you get a job, you get allowance. Uh, it pretty much appeals universally anybody can take up that offer and join ISIS is it goes beyond religion now. listen here this ISIS is looking for skilled people to help set up the new station the new state so they are looking for engineers uh -huh. doctors accountants maybe journalists <laughs> and they're also looking for women uh, and children to uh, probably accompany their men so they can actually go there and live as a whole family and they will actually provide you with housing even schools and uh, jobs just like uh, any normal community or any uh, government would do for the people <laughs> Gauri <laughs> this is getting scarier it's getting scary um, I feel that ISIS is so different from uh, the idea of Taliban, Al-Qaeda and all other terrorist organizations that we used to hear because I think ISIS is, def is really creating this framework of a state based mm -hmm. on their understanding of Islam and this is scary because people are actually attracted to this idea mm -hmm. not because they are against the western civilization but because they think that this would be the bedrock of what Islamic civilization is all about and uh, of course uh, we were saying earlier that the whole idea of ISIS started uh, as a response uh, to because the people were not happy with the current uh, regime that was uh, in the country and the presence of ISIS sort of gave them that escape, uh, that sort of new hope even uh, for people to see that, okay, maybe a change can actually happen. But uh, it's gone uh, far beyond that and it's gone to, it's become so something that 
people can all relate to when it comes to getting a job, bringing your family there. It's sort of like just migrating to a new country. Yep. And in fact, the foreign ministry in Indonesia is so worried right now that uh, has urged Indonesians with family members or relatives studying in the Middle East to keep close tab on them. In fact, they have been calling the government to do more at the grassroots level so people know what they could be getting into. Because the reality is, a lot of people most probably come from the village and do not understand the real situation. They might be fooled by the propaganda that life under ISIS means fulfilling or uh, live in an Islamic life. But then again, uh, of course, we were saying that uh, as much as this appeals to the Muslims, who can go there and feel like they can live their Islamic life? Uh, it, at the same time, it's also uh, so appealing to other uh, community as well. I mean, even if you were to ask any person just walking down the street, hey, do you want to move to a place where you'll get a job, a house, and you even get monthly allowance and your kids will get to go to school? I'm pretty sure that person would say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and they may not even know what they're saying yes to. Would you say yes, Gary? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky because I'm actually thinking about it. <laughs> I didn't say no right away. <laughs> I hope they don't build shopping malls and all these <laughs> capitalistic <will>. <laughs> elements. And and the funny thing is, they might be just another Arab country with money and community and all that. Anyway, another news is about defense ties. Uh, another country that is setting up closer defense ties with Australia right now is Vietnam. And Vietnam uh, is, uh, of course, fostering relationship with Australia. And this is surprisingly in uh, line with the South China Sea incident and they are trying to use Australia as their big brother here <laughs> <laughs> but will China actually feel intimidated by a country like Australia I don't think so <laughs> but I think what Australia can provide to Vietnam is definitely the know-how the knowledge the training and all that and I think Vietnamese troops definitely need those kind of skills uh, what they are looking right now is definitely two things. Geopolitically is to balance the power between China and the rest of Southeast Asia or in this case Asia Pacific to include Australia. And secondly uh, is to also share or pass, b pass down the knowledge on security and peace and uh, the art of defense. Uh, especially the South China Sea has become more and more Territorized by China. And it seems that uh, Vietnam and Australia also go back a very long way. Back uh, in the days during the Vietnam War, they also had uh, Australians fighting uh, alongside Vietnamese against uh, the US. So uh, it's quite clear where uh, Australia stands uh, in that case. And uh, they, the Prime Minister uh, also said that they are agreeing on the importance of assurance of peace, stability and of course he mentioned maritime security and freedom of navigation in the South China Sea and they believe that this should be done according to the international law and China shouldn't just come in and uh, start uh, claiming uh, parts of the sea which they think it belongs to them. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that uh, have been agreed for example, uh, as been told by the Vietnamese Prime Minister Nguyen Yen Tan Dung, he said that uh, the Australian counterpart, which is Tony Abbott, of course, has agreed during a meeting at the Parliament House to strengthen corporations on security and defense in a range of area, including experience and information sharing, English language training, and special forces cooperation. I think on the English language mm -hmm. part, I think Gauri, you'll be suitable as well to be <laughs> one yes, of the trainers. Definitely. <laughs> if they need me, they can just give me a call. And but uh, you need to speak with an accent. With what accent? <laughs> Australian accent? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, that, that's not my forte. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the great thing is also both of them... Uh, it seems they have uh, the same vision where both support the freedom of navigation by air and uh, both uh, deplore any unilateral changes to uh, the current status quo of the countries. I think not just Vietnam and Australia, the whole of Southeast Asia mm -hmm. most probably are thinking the same way as well. We will take another short break. When we return, we will talk about ASEAN and of course the open sky policy. Asia Dailies. 
first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Hi, this is Gary. And of course, you are back with us on our ASEAN Daily. Gary, one thing that is really exciting in terms of the AEC. I mean, of course, people are excited about the free flow of goods, mm-hmm. services, people. Uh, when I say people, is skilled labor. Yes. <laughs> I have to emphasize Not on that. Just people. <laughs> <laughs> but another thing that is exciting about the 10 ASEAN member is the mm-hmm. Open Skies mm-hmm. Policy. Yeah, and uh, this the 10 members of uh, ASEAN countries, it seems they are all on track for a single aviation market policy, which uh, will be completed by end of this year. And uh, the single aviation market, which is also known as SAM, uh, it seems uh, Sam. before this, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the abbreviation here is called SAM. So uh, it seems uh, that before this, uh, a few countries were actually not yet included. Some were on board, some were not quite on board. But this time, they have managed to reach a consensus and everyone agreed that this is a good idea and they should be a part of it. So this year, Philippines will be signing it. And once Philippines signs it, meaning that we, they will have all 10 ASEAN member states to have this SAM mm-hmm. <laughs> single aviation market. And I'm kind of excited about it because uh, we are talking about AEC and I think open skies policy is one of the closest thing that we can feel on AEC. And of course, it's also uh, geared towards uh, developing a very a unified and a single uh, aviation market in the region. And besides that, they are also looking for support uh, from China, Japan and South Korea uh, probably other countries in Asia as well to uh, sort of uh, support and back up this policy that uh, that's going to be implemented. Do you think they will support it? Uh, I'm pretty sure they will. But, but when it comes to AEC or uh, even the ASEAN integration, we always talk about connectivity and uh, that's something that uh, cannot really be avoided uh, in this region, especially when it comes to Asia uh, in this whole region where we are trying to uh, increase the connectivity between all the countries. That's true. In fact, aviation is one of the 12 priority areas uh, to establishment of the AEC. The liberalization of the ASEAN's aviation sector will be a major catalyst and I I think so because the region's economic growth by 2030 will only be proven when there's free flow of uh, of goods and services and people mm-hmm. and aviation will be one of the key uh, connectivity for that but China to support this I I think Philippines will have a lot of problems <laughs> Philippines and Vietnam Philippines and Vietnam will yeah. probably not be uh, too happy about it uh, but at the same time of course China probably has uh, a lot to offer because of the size of the country itself and the amount of people they have because another uh, important uh aspect of this open sky policy is of course to also boost the tourism industry uh, in each country and in that case China can definitely uh, contribute a lot to all the countries in the region but they probably don't want to send their people to Philippines and Vietnam <laughs> as well Definitely, and maybe Australia now since Australia <laughs> ganged up with Vietnam and another thing that I think would be one of the key benefit of the open skies policy is, of course, to uh, absorb and tapping into the number of unemployed pilots. As we all know, uh, the aviation industry actually is ha- facing a glut of pilots, and even uh, a lot of pilots are working long hours. They are being squeezed uh, to to somehow make money for these aviation uh, industries. And I think with a greater open skies policy, hopefully more pilots can come in and can enhance the aviation uh, uh, in terms of the frequency of aviation uh, of flights in Southeast Asia. And uh, it's also definitely important uh, for the overall integration of ASEAN, like we were saying mm. e- earlier, uh, when it comes to transport uh, linking or uh, removing barriers. Uh, it's very important to be able to connect to all the 10 countries and mm. also other countries, other important countries in the region. In fact, when you talk about the ability to connect, also also includes the ability to ensure safety and security. Uh, when you want to have people having confidence over ASEAN aviation success, it's all about giving that perception of safety and security, not just perception, but also the reality that is safe 
to fly anywhere in Southeast Asia. And uh, actually, yesterday we were attending a talk on AEC mm-hmm. and uh, Tan Sri Munir Majid was giving his speech. And he also talked a little bit about the aviation industry, how with the uh, recent tragedies that happened last year, people have uh, started becoming more wary about flying, mm-hmm. about planes and safety and security in general and he also said that ASEAN should start doing something about it they don't have to solve the problem but they have to do something, show some effort that they are trying to get the situation in control Mm -hmm. and this will in turn give confidence to the people that it's okay that, that it's safe to fly the irony part of it uh, the ASEAN Aviation Summit which happened uh, at Langkawi, Lima uh, and the MOU was signed on the Open Skies policy uh, which was be also being uh, exp- uh, explained by our Transport Minister Datuk Sri Liu Tiong Lai but at the same time people probably forgotten that uh, one flight uh, was uh, crashed at the Lima Langkawi there an Indonesian flight. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I think we, we still have a long way to go when it comes to providing security and uh, safety for our aviation industry. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a very important thing because uh, flying is actually uh, the most popular way to get from uh, one country to another. Of course, you don't want to slow things down. So, uh, definitely, they should step it up uh, in terms of security. Mm-hmm. So, that's all for our news today. Gauri? Yes. Where they can get us. <laughs> they can get us here in our studio, but <laughs> they can always uh, yeah, listen to us on our website, of course, uh, www.juranasean.com. And if they want to leave any feedback, can leave it on our Facebook page, on our Twitter page. And we also have uh, an Instagram where they can share photos with us. And uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the daily podcasts. And of course, they can always listen to us via mobile mm-hmm. on their tune-in app and search for Durian ASEAN. That's all from me, Aline, today. And this is Gauri. 